everybody and welcome along to another brand new video where today I want to talk about what I think is one of the maybe slightly lesser remembered kind of mini story arcs or just set of stories from the classic series. Of course it's season 18's The East Space Trilogy. So yes, this comes in the midst of the final season of uh, Tom Baker's reign as the Doctor, his seventh season. He'd, he'd really had been doing it for a very, very long time by this point. It was the turn of the 1980s. Um, we finally, we'd had a sort of change in production team with John Nathan Turner taking over as the producer for this season, of which he would then produce the rest of the classic series. Um, a real change and shift in tone, I think, as a, se as a season for season 18. It kind of brought back a lot more of the science-y and sort of sci-fi aspects of the, se of the series, rather than the kind of almost bringing in a bit of comedy that they brought in when the Graham Williams era a bit more having kind of coming off the back of having to lighten up the show from the Philip Hinchiff era that had gone too far into horror and darkness basically um, and so you feel like by this point they're kind of trying to go back a little bit towards that but in a more sciencey way and so that's where in the midst of this season we get this this opportunity for what's what's generally termed as the East Space Trilogy basically three stories um, in a succession that are set in the sort of alternative universe called East Space. Now this comes after the first two stories of the season. We have the Leisure Hive and Megloss that are pretty standard Doctor Two stories set in the normal universe of not really having any massive connection to anything greater. Um, but then we get Full Circle, which is the first story of this of this trilogy, where at the beginning of the story, the Doctor and Romana get you know caught in a weird sort of time disruption or something along those lines and get sucked into this alternate sort of universe of E space that's kind of opposite to our universe basically. Um, and you know it's 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 all a bit con high concept sci-fi and sciencey stuff that I must confess I'm not an expert on so I, I, I like I try to understand entropy and e-space and all those kind of things but I can't say that I'm really an expert that's just you know as much as I like sci-fi and that kind of thing I'm just not it's not my strongest suit shall we say but basically they end up in an alternative universe where there is no way back is probably the simplistic explanation for it. And so it gives the opportunity to create a sort of mini narrative through this season, um, all focused on getting back to the normal universe. They're, they're all what they call N space, then I guess normal space. I, I don't know, maybe it's probably not that, but you know, E space is the alternate universe that they're stuck in. And we spend these three stories stuck in there, exploring different sort of worlds and areas and things. And so in the first story, Full Circle, we we meet, we introduce the character of Adric as we turn up on this sort of slightly marshy planet um, where they're, they're, all this, this sort of colony of people are trapped basically on here thinking that they're going to fly away in this magical spaceship to a new world but that it's never ever going to be ready they're constantly building and creating and trying to work on this spaceship which is basically because the people who are in charge don't actually know how to fly the spaceship so they just pretend that you know that they, they're maintaining sort of maintaining it and fixing it and whatever but actually they can't fly it and we get introduced to the marshmen who are, who are the creatures that evolve into these people basically they think they're these weird aliens that they're going to attack and kill them all but actually it's just the sort of earlier evolution of the human or the humanoid people that we meet on this this planet as well and so this first story I don't want to focus too much on the sort of narratives of the story I'm more interested in kind of the e-space aspect of it and this story kind of focuses more doesn't doesn't focus hugely on the e-space point where it sort of introduces it and then kind of leaves it as a kind of lingering mystery of oh no how are we going to get back from e-space back into the normal universe and we kind of spend a bit of time exploring that um, the doctor kind of you know coming up with lots of theories and ideas of how they might be able to do it and, and so on and so forth and that and, and and as I say it introduces the character of Adric that story where he gets brought into the TARDIS I mean he kind of walks in at the end of the story and then oh by the way Adric's in this next story now didn't really realize that but hello there he is and the Doctor and Romana aren't even completely aware of this at all until you know halfway through States of Decay I think pretty much because he just goes off and does his own thing and I think it is notable to say that in both State of Decay and, and uh, Warrior's Gate it, I don't get the impression that Andrew was originally written to be in these stories because he has very, very small roles, very kind of coincidental roles. He has no influence on the story in, in any real material way. He's kind of just there to kind of get into a couple of scrapes, a little bit of trouble, and just kind of be forgotten about half the time, to be honest. Because, yeah, particularly in Warrior's Gate, I really don't feel like he does anything at all. I, maybe I'm forgetting that, but I really don't feel like he's at all involved in the story. So it's a little bit of a shame because I think he's, I don't think he's as bad a character as maybe many people think that he is. I think there could have been more that he that could have been done with the, the TARDIS team of the Doctor, Romana, K9 and Adric. So we move on then, the second part of the trilogy is the um, is State of Decay, written by Terence Dix, uh, a, a great man, a great writer, um, and it's a kind of classic vampire story, really, um, which, which also introduced a little bit more lore and, and mythology from the show, because it introduces us to the idea of the great vampires that were supposedly from the Dark Times, which I know has been heavily explored in the time of Victorious, whole, whole, whole thing. Um, and yeah, these, these mysterious vampires that, that sort of were extremely hard to kill, basically, 
basically, and one of the great enemies of the Time Lords back in the Dark Times is kind of the idea behind it. And so there's a very interesting sort of exploration of mythology there that's something that I think JNT wanted to reintroduce into the show quite a lot. Um, and it's kind of noticeable in this season how many more references to previous stories or, or Gallifrey or the Time Lords or whatever there is compared to many of the previous seasons just because JNT had a big thing about, you know, bringing in a bit more continuity and connection between stories. Um, and so, yeah, State of Decay focuses on vampires. It's a classic vampire story. And they only really kind of land on this vampire planet because they're looking for a way out of e-space and they hope that they're going to, you know, turn up and someone's going to be able to help them escape. Because, so the narrative is still there. It's still being focused upon and trying to escape e-space, um, even if it's not the kind of core point of each story, which I think is important, really, that they're still kind of Monster of the Week, classic Doctor who -y stories, just with that extra added sort of connecting element for them. And so, yeah, State of Decay is a pretty good, fun, enjoyable story focusing on the vampires. Um, but apart from that kind of initial aspect of trying to find where a way out of these spaces it's, it's not a huge focus of the story again it's kind of hinted and mentioned and here and there but it's not what the story is all about i think in the same way where warrior's gate becomes even more about that as we, as we head into that story so yeah state of decay it's a good vampire story definitely worth a watch um pretty not my favorite story ever but still pretty pretty good and so then we come on to the final story warrior's gate uh, that concludes this trilogy it also um writes out uh, Romana and K9. Romana decides to leave at the end of the story and K9 goes with her. Um, and so that kind of changes the TARDIS team and the TARDIS dynamic quite a lot, having had Romana, albeit in her two different incarnations, but having had her for the last two and a half seasons, really, since um, the beginning of season 16, uh, the Keith's time arc. So it kind of is a significant kind of ending point, really. It's also when um, the Doctor and Kurt, Doctor and Adric, ultimately only, are able to get back from E-Space into N-Space at the end of the story. Um, because, of course, Warrior's Gate brings us to the this mysterious gateway basically hence warrior's gate um which is it has all these mysterious lion-like people called and um, the tharals these time sensitive people who can kind of jump between the universes basically um and there's this gateway that the doctor and co can use to be able to get back into their normal universe essentially is the focus of the story i mean i have to say watching the warrior's gate for the first time as i did recently it's, it's a cracking story it's a, such a brilliant story so it's quite kind of it's very sort of science fiction heavy almost i guess you'd say when, when as much as doctor to is a science fiction program a lot of the time it doesn't really go that heavily into sci-fi whereas i feel like this story really is that and i think it's really really good for it there's so much ambition the, the direction is it's fantastic i love the direction it's so interesting and unique the music is brilliant just the whole concept and idea the setting the, the visuals i i think it all works so so effectively it's, it's one of those hidden gems i think for doctor who that I, I really wasn't expecting it but i watched it i was just like this is brilliant it is a little bit confusing i'm not going to try and pretend it's not that you do kind of need to watch it a couple of times or go and read up about it afterwards to fully understand exactly what's going on um, because there are some confusing aspects to it but I think as a whole story it is a brilliant conclusion to this trilogy and it's a nice way kind of just focusing bring, bringing the kind of whole narrative of these last two stories kind of to a head and making it the focus of this final story about this gateway we've got these slave trader people who are obviously trading the Tharals the time sensitives and they're also looking for that way out of, of eSpace and so you know they, they they kind of have the same goal that the Doctor and Co do so there's kind of that that focuses the story so much more on that than maybe the previous couple of stories and so of course ultimately by the end of the story the Doctor is able to use the you know the gateway and, and able to escape eSpace and that kind of le just leads us to carry on with um, the Keeper of Trark and the next story with the, the reintroduction of the Master before the Tom Baker's Doctor says goodbye in the following story Logopolis and so yeah it's one of those kind of forgotten mid-season arcs I think really I know I know that Doctor Who kind of does have a few of these you think season 12 and the Nerva Beacon storyline that kind of runs through three or four stories um, and so there are the occasionally these kind of mini arcs of slightly connected episodes and stories but I think that, that it, is, it is done quite well in season 18 even if it's a little bit forgotten about and I think it's also just a reminder of the continuing kind of different sort of uh, feel and vibe to the program by this point um in J J T taking over and chris rach bidmead as the um script editor and it's just it's just such a different perspective on what they want the show to be than what we'd seen in the previous seasons with with graham williams for example it's, and i th and i think it does work quite well for that as much as i don't think season 18 is one of the strongest seasons of doctor who i think the the the, the change in pace the diff the trying different things i think is is really really good for the show and it's the doctor who kind of survives on that change and and, th and renewal and things being different 
and I think that that's what's so important and what does work quite effectively in season 18 and particularly in this this three story arc as well so yes guys please do give me your memories of the space trilogy I didn't really want to sort of turn this into just a review of the three stories I want to just kind of focus on the space aspect of it and I, I, I think it is quite a nice trilogy but please guys do let me know your thoughts if you want to sort of review each story please do or just generally the idea of, of them getting stuck in eSpace and coming out again and how that's all come about and resolved please do let me know your thoughts down in the comments below but apart from that guys as always please hit that like button that subscribe if you're new here and I'll be again I'll be back again very soon for a brand new video goodbye